Imagine the sound and power of a single Hemi V8 engine. Now, imagine the sound of four under one hood. For nearly 45 years, this was the fastest wheel-driven automobile of its kind on the planet. I'm Matt Anderson, Curator of Transportation here at the Henry Ford, and this is Goldenrod. The search for more speed is as old as the automobile itself. Official land speed records were kept as early as 1902, and Henry Ford became the first American to claim a land speed record in January 1904 when he drove his race car, Arrow, over Michigan's frozen Lake St. Clair at 91.37 miles per hour. Very, very fast at that time. Ford quickly discovered really the greatest benefit of a land speed record is the publicity, and he used that record in his advertisements for Ford automobiles. Extreme speeds require open, level terrain. In the east, they would use beaches sometimes. In the west, they would use dry lake beds. Uh, here in the Midwest, they'd improvise, like Henry Ford on that frozen lake. Over time, the rules for a land speed record became standardized. You had to make two runs within one hour. And then the average between those two speeds would become your official record. In the 1930s, really, racers everywhere started to go to a landscape almost custom made for land speed records, and that's the Bonneville Salt Flats in western Utah. Situated on the remains of an ancient lake, the flats, as they would come to be known, covered 46 square miles. There's nothing to hit anywhere around you. A car like Goldenrod can take up to 10 or 12 miles to make one run for a land speed record. It's got to have all that space to get up the speed, to go the speed, and then to slow back down safely. The Bonneville Salt Flats are one of the few spaces in the world where you can achieve those kinds of speeds. Speed records at Bonneville climbed each year, 301 miles per hour in 1935, 350 in 1938, 394 in 1947, and by the late 1960s, jet engines pushed cars past 600 miles an hour. Drivers would take jet engines that they would literally just mount onto chassis and these engines would push the car with jet thrust, and you could achieve all kinds of speed with that. But there were some purists who said, that's not really a car. Among those purists were brothers Bill and Bob Summers of Ontario, California, veterans of the salt. The brothers had raced a series of imaginative single-engine cars starting in 1954. One of their vehicles uh, was called the Polywog. It looked a little like a tadpole with the traditional two wheels set apart up front but then two wheels in the back in line, so they weren't afraid of trying new things. In late 1963, they hatched plans for a four-engine racer with a body sleeker and more narrow than anything seen before. I describe Goldenrod as being like a bullet, and you look at it, it really is shaped that way. It's designed to just cleave through the air as smoothly as possible. It's extremely narrow, measures only 48 inches wide, but 32 feet long. It's very low, just 28 inches at the hood line, only 42 inches back here at the tail, and it's packed with four engines that together produce 2,400 horsepower. Just a tremendous package of power. Yet designing and building a safe, functional, land speed record car requires every ounce of a hot rodder's skill and every dollar he can find. It's uh, not for the faint of wallet. And the Summers brothers were not wealthy. I mean, they were regular working guys. Anything they did had to be financed either out of their own pockets or with support from big corporate benefactors. So Bob Summers actually went out on a tour trying to meet with some of the big promoters to try and find some dollars to support their idea for Goldenrod. And he had the good fortune there to run into a fellow named George Hurst of Hurst Performance Products. Hearst had a, a natural kind of inclination to support these kind of projects and he became the real kind of golden ticket or guardian angel for the Summers Brothers. He went out there and got them connected with Chrysler, who would supply the engines, Mobile Oil, who supplied racing fuel and lubricants for the car, and Firestone, which uh, designed and built some specially made tires for this vehicle. Setting up shop in a converted vegetable stand, the Summers Brothers and their small crew worked around the clock. Bill, who handled administrative duties, took the day shift, while Bob preferred working at nights when interruptions were fewer. By the end of 1965, their car was finished. 
it made its first Bonneville runs on September 1st, clocking in at 244.9 miles per hour. It was a good start, but not nearly good enough for a record. The record at that time stood at about 403 miles an hour, so they had a long way to go. They expected a few mechanical problems, some gremlins. Anytime you're trying out new technology like this, you're bound to run into some bugs. I think they had more than they bargained for. In fact, on uh, the first run, they felt like only three of the engines were working. Indeed, that was the case, so they had to get that arranged, and they also had to deal with problems with the weather. So it's maybe not a surprise that the brothers actually ended up taking Goldenrod back to California for repairs, back out to Bonneville two times that fall, and it wasn't until early November that they finally got their shot at the record. Goldenrod was running on borrowed money and borrowed time when they returned to Utah in November. It was the morning of November 12th. They finally got their chance to make the run. The weather was gray and overcast. There was some drizzle, so not perfect conditions, but good enough and time was running out, so they were gonna take it. They started at 9.25 a.m. Bob Summers behind the wheel. He hits the throttle, has a perfect run, no problems, it's great. But of course they have to turn the car around and it's got a wide turning radius. You can't turn that wheel more than 10 degrees in either direction. They have to do a safety check to make sure everything's fine for the return trip. They've only got five minutes left, so they're up against the clock. Bob gets in there, hits the throttle, they make that return run. Everything's flawless. The time is announced, the average 409.277 miles an hour. That's it, they beat the record. Goldenrod had set a new world land speed record for a wheel-driven automobile. So the crew goes nuts. They start dancing, they pick up Bob Summers, hoist him on their shoulders, and for that moment, they're on top of the world. Just an incredible moment, and uh, you know, it's hard to imagine how satisfying it must have been to finally conquer that record. It wasn't until 2010 that someone came out with a non-supercharged car and finally beat the Golden Rod's record. They set a record of 414 miles an hour, so not all that much faster than Goldenrod did uh, 45 years earlier. Today, Goldenrod rests in Henry Ford Museum, a testament to what can be accomplished with limitless determination, and it's a reminder of speed's enduring call.